for to welcome you to our worship today. It is the second Sunday in the season of Easter. We are so grateful for Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Just a few announcements before we begin. Still in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, we are requested by our governor to stay at home. And so we are so saddened that we do not have the privilege and the opportunity to commune with you. That will be coming, and that will certainly be a sweet time for us to be reunited. But until that time, we will continue to provide these services for you online. We have a mixture or blended service over the next couple of weeks. Since again, normally we broadcast our contemporary worship service, our 11.30 a.m. revolution service. Uh, so this is an opportunity during this season while we're apart from one another to do a, more of a combined or blended service. Some elements of the contemporary service, some elements of the traditional service, and we hope that you uh, are blessed by the services that we do over these next few weeks. The one other announcement that I would like to point out to you, we still have an ongoing food drive for the residents of East Pittsburgh and Turtle Creek and the surrounding communities. There are many people who are falling between the cracks and not getting sufficient food to feed their families, and so we ask you to continue to be generous giving of yourselves, of the gifts that God has given you, purchasing some extra food, giving me a holler, call me on the phone, I'll certainly be glad to take in the collection of food that you are able to bring in for us, non-perishable items, we would certainly be grateful for those things. Or you can donate directly to the church if you go to our website at holytrinityeastpgh.com, there is a donate button there. You're welcome to click on the donate button and give something to our community outreach. We would certainly be grateful for it. There's also an opportunity to give your regular tithes and your offerings at that donate button as well, too. And we just thank you again for your support and for your kindness of the church during these difficult days as we continue to try to be a blessing to our residents in East Pittsburgh. I know you're here to worship, so let us continue our worship with the affirmation of our faith and the affirmation of our baptisms. We give thanks this day in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Joined in Christ in the waters of holy baptism, we're clothed with God's mercy and forgiveness. Let us therefore give thanks for the gift of holy baptism. We give you thanks, O God. We know that it was in the beginning that your Holy Spirit moved over the waters. By your word you created the world, calling forth life in which you took delight. Through the waters of the flood you delivered Noah and his family. Through the sea you led your people Israel from slavery into freedom. And at the river your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By water and your word you claimed us as daughters and sons, making us heirs of your promise and servants of all. We praise you for the gift of water that sustains life. And above all, we praise you for the gift of new life in Jesus Christ. Shower us with your Holy Spirit. Renew us and our lives with your forgiveness, grace, and love. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue our worship with the singing of our opening hymn.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Mighty God, in whom we know the power of the redemption, you stand among us in the shadows of our time. As we move through every sorrow and trial of this life, uphold us with knowledge of the final morning, when in the glorious presence of your risen Son, we will share in his resurrection, redeemed and restored to the fullness of life and forever freed to be your people. Amen. Our first lesson of the second Sunday of Easter is found in the book of Acts, the second chapter. So Peter stood up with the eleven, and he raised the voice and he addressed the crowd. People of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did amongst you through him. As you yourselves know, 
This man was handed over to you by God's set purposes and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to a cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also live in hope, because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Brothers and sisters, I can tell you with confidence that the patriarch David died and was buried. His tomb is here to this very day. But he was a prophet who knew of God, that God promised him an oath that he would place one of his descendants on the throne. And seeing what was ahead of him, he spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of this fact. Here ends the first lesson. The psalm, the psalm 16, the congregation may read with me every other frame on the uh, screen today. Protect me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the holy ones in the land, they are the noble in whom is all my delight. Those who choose another God multiply their sorrows, their drink offerings of blood. I will not pour out or take their names upon my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel, and the night also my heart instructs me. I keep the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad, my soul rejoices, my body also rests secure. For you do not give me up to Sheol, or let your faithful ones see the pit. You show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Yeah. 
Our gospel for this Sunday in the season of Easter is found in the book of Luke, or John, the 20th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being shut where the disciples were at for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood amongst them and said, Peace be with you. Now when he had said this, he showed himself his self to the disciples, both his hand and his sides, and the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Now Jesus said again to them, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so send I you. And when he had laid, said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples said to them, We have seen the Lord. But Thomas said, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, and place my finger in the mark of the nails, and place my hand in his side, I will not believe. No eight days later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. The doors were shut, but Jesus came and stood amongst them and said, Peace be with you. And he said to him, Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands. Put your hand out your hand and place it in my side. Do not be faithless, but believing. Thomas answered him, My Lord, my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed in me because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, open up our hearts to your word this day, that we might be inspired by your presence. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. There is a handout that you are welcome to download. It's connected to, or underneath, I should say, the announcement for this Sunday's service. And this is about Thomas, and maybe you sang that great song. I shouldn't say it's a great song. It actually is an annoying song. Don't be a doubting Thomas. Do you remember that song back in high school or in, uh, in Sunday school classes? Well, we're going to debunk this idea about Doubting Thomas. And I'm going to stand up here today to tell you that I share a lot more in common with Thomas than I probably do with any other of the disciples. And so today, it's a very personal thing, a confession of a Doubting Thomas. And I believe that Thomas gets a really bad rap. He gets a bad reputation, we dismiss him as a disciple, we think less, less of him, but he is actually the very first disciple of Jesus' disciples to figure out that Jesus is not just the Messiah, but he is also God. I would say that makes him a spectacular disciple of Jesus Christ. And notice one of the things in the lesson for today, although I wasn't as big a fan of this translation as I am of some of the other translations, I'm a big fan of the New American Standard Version, which I wish I'd read. It would have given a little bit clearer picture of the translation of this Greek text. Jesus never indicts Thomas for his lack of faith or his need to touch him and feel him. I mean, let's face it, we're all Missouri State, aren't we? We need to touch it, to feel it, to believe it, to be true. Every single one of us. And God has made us that way. For Jesus, however, what he does is he uses this opportunity, these questions by Thomas, as an opportunity to commend you and me. Those of us who would not have a relationship with Christ in the same way as the disciples did, we don't get to touch and feel him. So in one sense, we are more spectacular because of that faith, believing in Jesus without having the opportunity to touch him, to feel him. We will be especially blessed, Jesus says. So it's not necessarily Jesus that Thomas doubts, but the testimony of the hysterical disciples. He thought they were a little bit crazy. So I don't think Thomas was doubting in Jesus. He was doubting the witness of the disciples. Now, when we look at the Bible, the Bible is just filled with a lot of people who were great people of faith, who had severe experiences and seasons of drought and doubt in their life. First of all, we look at Abraham. Abraham doubted in the provision of God, and so he tries to take his security in his own hands and lies about his relationship with Sarah to protect his own neck. Jacob 
has a wrestling match with God, and guess what? He wins! He beats God. It's kind of amazing. God finally cheats. He kind of uh, takes uh, uh, Jacob's, sets Jacob's uh, uh, hip socket out of joint, and that's the only way God can win, because Jacob's winning! Moses often asked God to prove himself, if you take a look in Exodus. Mo Moses even had doubts about God's mission, about God's purpose that was given to him, but the task of shepherding the people, the troublesome flock of the Jews, from, into the promised land. He begs God, God, if you really love me, just kill me now. <laughs> and I'll be a happy man, because I'm so tired of these people. How often does he say that? The psalmists regularly question why God allows suffering. It is a theme that is repeated over and over and over again in the Psalms. Jonah, Jonah, when he goes to proclaim condemnation on the land of Nineveh and God spares them, God is merciful to them, he gets really ticked off and he says, God, how can you do this to me? You're embarrassing me. You're making a mockery of my name. You make me look like a liar. And so Jonah doubts God. And so Jonah is sitting there on the hillside, and after he sees that the city is not destroyed, his tree wilts, and oh, poor Jonah, that nice shady leafy tree, as he waited for the destruction of Nineveh, it dried up, and so he had a nice little pity party for himself. Oh, poor me, the prophet of God is made a liar because God is a merciful and good and kind God. Job wonders aloud why good God would allow the oppression of a righteous man such as he. Peter vowed that he was going to die with Jesus. And he was given the opportunity to do that in the night which Christ was betrayed. But then he decided that Jesus wasn't worth dying for after all. Though, in the end, Peter did die for his faith in Christ. You and I worry about the, the things that are going on today. <laughs> price of gasoline. Well, actually, the price of gasoline is pretty good right now. We worry about the stock market. We're about how we're going to get food on the table. The continued existence of Social Security, the country itself, is at risk. Our health insurance policies, the health of this economy right now, the safety of this country. And we wonder and doubt. Because that's what we do as human beings, isn't it? I'm going to outright confess to you, I had a very lengthy season of doubt in this congregation as a pastor, probably about 10 years ago. It was probably a good 8 to 10 year significant drought in my life where every single day I got up and I wondered, I'm preaching a gospel I'm not sure I actually believe in. But I told the people, look, you need to have faith for me in my season of doubt. And I wrestled with God in my relationship with God. Doubt, I'm here to tell you, is just the normal part of a person's faith journey. It is not contradictory to it. I want you to hear what I'm saying. It is normal to doubt. Faith is not the absence of doubt any more than courage is the absence of fear. It wouldn't be courage if you weren't afraid. It wouldn't be faith if you didn't have doubt. Because you have doubt and you still take a step forward in your faith indicates the type of faith that you have. Despite the fact that I have doubts, I take a step today believing in God. Faith is an action that we take regardless of the doubts that we have in our life because that is what makes it faith. So I'm going to ask a question myself and kind of answer it for you. What keeps me moving in my seasons of doubt? where I wonder about God. And there are a lot of things. Notice, this is probably the most important thing, and you can add your own to that, and I'd appreciate your feedback too. In my seasons of doubt, it's those grace moments in life that God gives to me, on which I feast in my times of famine. Those amazing, spectacular things that happen. The birth of a child. A miraculous event. A caring person who comes into your life just at the right moment when you've lost doubt. People of faith, other people of faith, encourage me in my time of doubts. People who've walked through disastrous times in their life, and they've made it through. And they serve as an example for me. They've made it. I can too. Great men and women who died for something. Something that they never had the opportunity to see. Moses. 
He died before he ever entered the promised land. He saw it from a distance, but he never got to enter into it. There are many Christians, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who never did see the ending and the destruction of Nazi Germany. He was killed before that happened. Even though, so he resisted Adolf Hitler. He was killed for his faith. And it was because of great men and women of faith that that country eventually collapsed in on itself. More brilliant people than I, there are such, such wonderfully brilliant, intelligent Christians in this world. And they believe, despite the fact that sometimes it seems folly and foolishness to have faith. And I find encouragement from that. Support and encouragement from other Christians. As I said to you, there are time and a season in my life where I needed the support of this church because I wasn't sure I believed everything that I was preaching. And I said, you have to believe for me in my deep and dark seasons of doubt. There's another reason why I believe, because I know that there's a Satan. I've never doubted that. I see the evil that's in this world. And if there's a Satan, then boy, there's got to be a God. And lastly, the most important is the gift of the Holy Spirit. We've mentioned the Spirit's name multiple times here today already. It is the Holy Spirit that intercedes for me. When I have run out of words, when I have run out of faith, when I've got to the very edge and end of my rope, and I can't seem to hold on any longer, the Holy Spirit intercedes for me on my behalf. And so I'm encouraging you today. This is a time of great fear. This is a time of great doubt. So we need to believe for each other and support each other in this season of despair and frustration so that we might pick each other up, encourage one another, and bring each other into the fullness of that relationship with Christ. Let us give thanks. Heavenly Father, we do thank you again for sustaining us in these difficult days, these challenging times. It is a very frustrating time right now for our country and for our world. There are people starving to death. There are people who do not know where their provision is coming from. God, there are those who are concerned about their health, who are in the hospital, who are walking that deep and dark valley between the shadow and the shadow of death. We pray, God, that even amidst the shadow of death, even amidst these fears that we have in life, we would know that we are in your hands. Give us faith that might see us through these, this season of doubt. For he asks us in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us sing our hymn of the day. Give thanks to God. Keeper of the stars, Lord of time and space, of my life friend of
Christ our Lord, let us confess together the faith that unites us as one people of God. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and he is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks for your mercies, your love, your graciousness that you have towards your people. We know that this is a challenging time for us, for our world, and we pray that you would intervene on our behalf. May your mercy be upon us. I do not think there is any judgment that's being made upon us, your people. I just think these are one of the great tragedies that happens. And it is an opportunity to test your church. And so we pray that your church would not fail the people of this world, that we would give generously of what we have received from Jesus Christ. First of all, the gift of God's love through Jesus, but also those financial and those economic and those very tangible needs that we can supply for those of us who still have jobs or able to put food on our table and have more than plenty. Help us be generous for those who have less. We pray for those who struggle, those who've lost their jobs. We pray for those who are economically challenged to begin with. And we pray for those who put their lives at risk every single day on our behalf, that you would also continue to keep them safe, our doctors, our nurses, the aides, all of those who work in the hospitals. We pray for our police officers, our firemen and women, all the EMS workers continue to be with them. We also lift up those who work in our grocery stores and those who put food on our shelves that we might go and purchase these things. And God, every day they put their lives at risk for a very minimal salary. And there just does seem to be something not righteous and not right about that. So I'm praying, God, that uh, you would reward them and help us as a society to be more grateful and thankful for those who work every single day for our comfort and for our blessing. We lift up our partners in faith here in this community for New Day Ministries, for St. John Orthodox, for Manafron High. We lift up our Bishop, Wilma Kucherik, our Slovak Zion Synod congregations as they minister in their particular communities. We pray for our missionaries throughout the world. We pray also for the people of this world. For certain, we are all facing this together. Give us courage and give us faith. The Lord, there are also other daily concerns upon our lives beyond this virus that has inflicted this world right now. There are still people who struggle with cancer. There are still people who are living in broken relationships and yet in, in, in one sense they're in very close quarters in some cases because of this virus. And so I'm praying for your peace and your reconciliation upon households and broken relationships. And Lord, whatever else is in our hearts and minds, those 
sicknesses, those concerns, those things in our hearts, we take this opportunity to lift them to you today. In your hands, O Lord, we commit all those for whom we pray, and we trust your mercy for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Let us pray together the prayer the Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now may you receive the Lord's blessing this day. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. Amen.